few years ago, my sweetie Joseph and I made plans to go to this apple cider festival in Massachusetts. It happens every November, and we were both really looking forward to this event. But when the time came to leave Vermont to go to the festival, I felt like this dark cloud of doom and depression just like settled over my head. And so while Joseph had an awesome time at the festival rubbing elbows with all the local apple gurus, I spent the weekend in the car. And I started to wonder if this is what it feels like to have a major depression take hold in your life. And so as we were leaving Orchard Country on Sunday to come back to Vermont, we go around the a curve in the road and there's this pile of junk next to someone's driveway and a big sign that says free and there's like broken sleds and children's toys and I'm like Joseph pull over and he's like we don't need any more junk and I'm like pull over and so he pulls over and I hop out of the car and I pick up this white two foot tall cat statue it's made of plastic but it's supposed to look porcelain and it has a nicotine stained patina to it like it's been in someone's smoking parlor for the past 70 years and it's got these black demonic eyes, like not like a normal living creature's eyeballs. There was no retina, it was just like doom and death in the eyes. And it was really matching my mood and I just loved it. And Joseph's like, that is the scariest looking cat I've ever seen in my entire life. Like that cat is not getting in this car. And I was like, Joseph, we need this cat. And he's like, what do we need it for? And I'm like, I don't know. I just feel like it needs to come with us. And like, we could use it for target practice. I don't know. And so I get in the car with the cat and there's not room for it in the back seat. So I kind of have to nestle it between us in the front seat. And so it's just Joseph, the cat and I. And we're driving down the road and five minutes into this cat joining our trip, I get a cell phone call, and it's my brother, and he says, Leslie, dad has pneumonia. The nurse says he has 12 to 15 hours left to live. He's dying. And my dad had a heinous form of Parkinson's disease and had been sick for the past eight years, and so this moment was a long time coming. And I tell my brother, we're two hours from Boston, we'll be there as soon as we can. And I hang up the phone, I look at Joseph, I look at the cat, and I'm thinking, all right, the demonic free pile kitty of death has joined us from the underworld for my dad's passing, and we got this, we got this. I'm trying to like rally myself, but then I burst into tears, and we book it to Boston, and pull up in front of my dad's house that he owned with his girlfriend, and the first thing I do when I get out of the car is I take the cat and I put it at the base of this aluminum ramp that we had installed over the front stairs so that we could get my dad's wheelchair in and out of the house, and so the cat is like facing out towards the road, and it just felt really comforting to have this cat like guarding the entranceway to the house. And so I walk up the ramp, and halfway up the ramp, I pause to collect myself for what I'm about to walk into. Because A, my dad is dying, and I have a lot of grief about it. And B, I'm gonna have to interact with my dad's girlfriend, and her and I don't get along. And so I have a lot to prepare myself for. And so I go in the house, and my brother is sitting with my dad, who's in a recliner. And my dad lost his ability to speak about a year prior, and he hadn't been able to walk for three years. So he'd been in a pretty debilitated condition for a while now. And I kiss him on the forehead, I say, hey, Pops. He looks at me with this bewildered look, then realizes it's me, smiles, and then falls asleep. And then we hear a knock at the door, and it's a hospice nurse, and she comes in, and my brother and I are relieved, and she tells us, you know, what it might look like to die from pneumonia, and what we can expect, and how we can support my dad, and she gives us morphine, and tells us how to administer it. And then she's like, all right, gotta go, call me if you have any questions, bye. And I was like, wait a minute, because I had just read this book on death and dying, and the chapter on hospice really melted my heart because hospice sounded like this incredible service where trained and compassionate nurses come and care for the dying person, but also help the family through the experience, and I just expected someone to be there with us. And so she leaves, and then we hear the front door fly open with a bang, and it's Maureen, my dad's girlfriend. And she just thunders into the house and roars to no one in particular, what the fuck is that cat doing in the front yard? <laughs> I am not from Boston, just so you know. And I'm thinking, all right, we don't have hospice, but we've got the cat who, as far as I can tell, hasn't introduced itself yet. We don't know its name. And it has really demonic eyes, but I'm just, I love it. And Maureen just like thunders into the kitchen and starts like shuffling food around and counting coupons and counting calories and like bringing my stress level up like 10 notches. And my brother and I are trying to take care of my dad and we get him from the recliner and into a hospital bed that he'd been sleeping in. And slowly friends and neighbors show up to say goodbye to my dad and pay their regards. And so Joseph and I camp out in the corner of my dad's bedroom. 
and we start playing the card game Rummy, and this weird thing just keeps happening with like every hand, it feels like the cards are stacked in my favor. And so at the end of the game, it's like 500 Joseph to me, I'm sorry, 500 me to zero Joseph. And it just feels really uncanny. And I start thinking about this card, or I start thinking about this conversation I had with my dad about a year ago before he stopped being able to talk. And I said to him, hey pops, I know you're an atheist and you're not spiritual whatsoever, but if there is consciousness after death, you like keep an eye out on me, right? And he said, yes, of course, and burst into tears. And then shortly after that, lost his ability to speak. And it just felt like he was here in this moment, like he was trying to say through the card game, like, there's no way in hell some hippie boyfriend dude is gonna beat my daughter at Rummy on my deathbed. <laughs> and this just like, I just lose it. And I'm crying and I go to my dad's bed and he's asleep, but he's also crying and I'm a mess. And the next day, my dad's still alive and he seems to be in pain and we're giving him the recommended doses of morphine and it's not helping. My brother gets on the phone with hospice and they put him on hold and um, basically give us the message of like, just give them stronger doses and figure it out. And it was like, up until this moment, we'd kind of been expecting someone to help us or waiting for, you know, someone to guide this experience and that person wasn't gonna come. And so we realized like, we needed to step up and figure this out for my dad. And so we go into his room and we turn the lights down low and we light some candles and we burn, I find this like sage smudge stick in his desk that we burn. And I start reading poetry that I think a dying atheist like my dad might appreciate. And my brother plays some of his favorite music, like the soundtrack to The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. You know, the song that's like... <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and um, my dad had this affinity for like Andean flute music. And we tell him we love him, we share stories, we tell him we forgive him for leaving us when we were little and we tell him it's okay to go. And slowly the energy in the house just comes down so many notches and Maureen starts chilling out and she stops counting coupons and she even cracked a joke about the cat in the front yard. And this peace just starts to settle on my dad's bedroom. And at eight o'clock that night, I crawl into my dad's hospital bed next to him and I wrap my arm around him and I have this dream where I'm a small child and he's an adult and he's leading me up this mountain. And then halfway through the dream, I realize I'm the adult and he's the kid and I'm leading him, leading him. And we're climbing this mountain, but then we're also descending. And the last thing I remember before I wake up is the silhouette of my dad as a child and me holding his hand and this cat with its tail in the air between us. And I wake up and I realize that the end is near. And at 6 a.m. the next morning, my dad's skin starts to turn gray and we're there with him and we're holding his hand and telling him that we love him and Maureen's there and it's fine. And then finally, he takes his last breath and it's really peaceful and calm. And I just wish there was some way to press pause on this moment and to spend a little bit more time with my dad and let it sink in that he's dead and he's not suffering anymore. But I know in my heart this moment can't last and I, we have to make a phone call and we have to call the brain guy because my dad decided he wanted to donate his brain to research and he had this rare brain disease that they couldn't figure out if it was Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or maybe both. And because neurological brain diseases are more devastation than a life should be asked to bear, he really wanted to support finding a cause and a cure. And so my brother calls hospice and the doctors were really um, adamant that, you know, as soon as he dies, there's a short window where they can come and harvest the brain and we got to get him out of there quick. And so the thought of my dad's like brain in a refriger refrigerator later is a little hard to swallow. So my brother gets on the phone with them and they send the brain guy over in a hearse and I watch as they wheel my dad down the aluminum ramp and past the cat and into the hearse. And the cat's there and I just feel a cat like presiding over all of this, helping me do that cat thing of embracing the rhythm of life and death and helping me hunt around in my psyche's inner landscapes for the deeper parts of myself and helping me bring them forward unapologetically into the waking day. And I just started thinking about how most people I talk to want a short and painless and easy death. They don't want to burden their family members. They don't want anyone to wipe their butt. But my dad's death wasn't like that. My dad's death was long and torturous. It involved many years of butt wiping and bed sores, legal disagreements with Maureen, and long hospital visits. It really was an apprenticeship in death and dying. And here we were coming out the other end of it, Death no longer seemed demonic or scary. My dad's death felt like a warm friend, an end to the suffering. And for the first time in my life, I could see how maybe death could be a friend to me someday too. 
And so my brother and I, we pour our heart into this epic obituary for my dad. We get it in the Boston Globe. We hold an end of life ceremony. We celebrate my dad in the way he wanted to be celebrated, which included a tub of cupcakes from Costco. <laughs> and then it's time to come back to Vermont. We're loading up the, my car to come back and everything's all ready to go. And I pick up the cat and Joseph's like, Leslie, you can't bring the cat back with us. Like, the cat's gotta stay here. And I'm just thinking like, I'm really attached to this cat at this point. And I have these visions of maybe like sticking it out in the woods behind our house and I could go visit it when I miss my dad. And so I stick it in the car. We start driving back to Vermont. And a few miles later, I'm thinking, you know, someone else might need this cat and it doesn't feel right to take it. And so I pull the car over and I leave the cat exactly how I found it, on the side of the road. Thank you. Josie. Love it. When I was seven, I learned how to ice skate in New York City in someone's apartment. <laughs> my parents divorced when I was little, and um, my brother and I would spend every other weekend visiting my dad. And even though his apartment was only 17 blocks from our house, it felt like a world away. My brother and I shared a small room with a bunk bed that had a wicked shimmy. And um, my father was the kind of dad who just didn't know what to do with kids. He didn't know what made us happy. He was anxious around us. And by the end of the weekend, he looked like he had a headache. And then in those moments, I realized the weekend wasn't long for only me. Um, and my father would start every weekend because he had no idea what to do with us. He'd say, hey kiddos, what do you guys want to do today? Museum of Natural History. My brother would shout before he, my father even finished the sentence. So Museum of Natural History just always won. And I had a childhood stutter that rendered me effectively mute during these morning conversations. So for years and years, all we would do was go to the Museum of Natural History. And I hated it. <laughs> I didn't like dinosaurs. They scared me. You know, you walk in the Great Hall of the, the, of, of the Museum of Natural History, and it's giant life-size dinosaurs and they look kind of cool but they made me feel even smaller in a big world and I would always try and touch the bones and my brother would angrily yank my device don't you're gonna ruin it for me and because he was afraid we we're gonna get kicked out and, and my brother was a tough kid um, he had a very low frustration point and a hot temper and it was you could always tell because his, his eyes would get a certain set to them, and you could see him thinking fists or epic tantrum. And you never knew which way he was going to go. And I think, honestly, one of the reasons we went to the museum wasn't because Harris said it first. It's because my father was afraid of him and afraid of the tantrums that he knew he couldn't control. And we go to the museum, and every once in a while, I catch my brother. You know, those, they had those dioramas of, like, the naked cavemen. And that always kind of freaked me out because they're just like these naked guys with pelts of fur and like you can see a little tiny tip of penis and I just thought, really, is that? <laughs> and the women with their hangy downy breasts just depressed me. And I thought, am I gonna turn into like hairy hangy downy low? And I just didn't like it. And, and my brother loved it. He identified with them and I could see him looking in the glass like trying on the caveman poses. <laughs> Like somehow he was looking for Neanderthal masculinity that was missing in our house, clearly. And it just, you know, it just never worked for me. And there was one day that um, we went there and my, um, my brother was told that the hall he wanted to go to was closed for renovation. And he punched a hole in a wall and stalked off. And I was like, yes, we're going someplace else today. And, um, and the next weekend, not coincidentally, my, my father said, hey, guess what we're doing today, kiddos? And I was like, what? He said, we're going ice skating. Ice skating? Never been ice skating before. I'd heard about it, I'd seen it, but it, we'd never done it. And my father sucked at a lot of things, but my God, he found the best ice skating place in New York City. It was on West 58th Street. It was called Le Petit Ice Skating Studio. <laughs> it was in someone's apartment. <laughs> They had this giant pre-war apartment and they converted the front entryway in the dining room into an ice skating rink that was probably about this big, actually. It was 20 by 32 feet. And 
I found my words on the ice and it was amazing because I could ice skate and my brother couldn't. <laughs> and he was 15 months older than me and he always was better at me than physical things, but he couldn't ice skate. Ice skating scared him. And his, his version of ice skating was just falling a lot, hot tears and saying, stop looking at me. And I'm like, I'm going too fast to look at you, you know? <laughs> and because it was a rectangle, you, you had to turn in a really weird way because you couldn't turn, really. And I wasn't good enough yet, so you'd kind of smack the wall and go the other way. And in three glides, you smack the other wall because it doesn't take long. And, I'm, and every time I'm smacking mine, my brother is still crying. I'm like, oh, get over it. But I loved it. And we called it Le Petit. And the cool thing about Le Petit was, first of all, it had no front wall. So it was like this. It was like skating on an infinity pool. <laughs> and when you're seven, you feel like that's really far down. It's not, but it felt like it was 20 feet. I felt like I was gonna die. So there was element of scare there and excitement. And the back wall was all glass and open out onto their living room. <laughs> so I'm like skating, taking a lesson and there are people behind me having mimosas because they're having brunch. So like they're watching me, I'm watching them, and I felt like we're in a Woody Allen movie. Like it was such a New York moment, and um, and we loved it. And we told our grandfather, like, Grandpa, we can skate. And he's like, Oh my God, kids, this is amazing, because he had a pond on his property, and he said we're gonna skate on the pond. And I was like, Okay, Grandpa. I need to preface this with something. My grandfather was a very very smart man, not so good in nature. Because to test the ice of his pond, you know, rather than walking out onto the ice and, you know, kind of doing this, he drove his Cadillac <laughs> onto the pond. He said, you can't stay on the shore, I got this. We're like, no, you don't, Grandpa, you just... And his name was Grandpa Percy. I mean, really, does someone named Percy have any skill at figuring out if kids can skate on ice or not? Probably not. And, um, this guy had an office job. So he drives his, this is 1972, like two ton Cadillac. I'm just like, this is a big, the biggest Cadillac they made. And he's driving his Cadillac onto the right in the middle of the pond. And he's in the front seat and he's bouncing <laughs> to see what's gonna happen. And even I know as a little seven year old, I'm like, this is not gonna end well. And I look at my brother and I'm like, what did we weigh, like 60 pounds total? What is grandpa thinking? <laughs> Two tons, 60 pounds. And then we hear this deafening crack and the ice split right down the middle of the car. You have never seen a seven year old man move as fast as my grandfather did in that moment. Cause he's like, oh shit. And he, and he gets out of the car, he flies out of the car, gets to the shore just in time to watch his red Cadillac sink into the pond. And this was the scariest and also the most hilarious thing I had ever seen in my life. And then the following year, he did the exact same thing, but with a red Cadillac. And that, that, that year I just thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. Because it was, I mean, and then the following year, it, like there's no learning curve for anything in my family. In the following year, he, um, he got smart and he had a friend with him and they tied a chain to the back of the car. <laughs> and he had his tractor at the ready. He's like, okay, Percy, I got it. And the first crack of the ice, they, you know, and he's like, no, no, don't, don't wheel in. The guy's like, no, we gotta save the car. You're, you're, and he pulls the car, and, and you know, I gotta say, in those three years before my grandpa died, we never skated there. <laughs> it's just in my little, the petite place, you know. Um, and then we, we moved, um, and my mom and my brother and I got season tickets to the new hockey team, the NHL, the, um, the Islanders. And so we, we thought, we're gonna skate more. And we went to Kenyak Park and we skated every summer and we loved it. And again, my brother still, he could finally skate, but he wasn't as good as me and I could skate away faster than him. And I skated way fast because I was pissed that I was a girl and I was stuck in girls roles and I had to wear white figure skates and all I wanted were black boys hockey skates because I wanted to go fast. I didn't want the toe pick thing. I didn't want to do the swirl, I wanted that off. I wanted to play hockey, and there was no way a girl my age back then could play hockey for anybody. 
So I would skate backwards like my favorite defenseman, and then my brother, I would just like, you know, do those spring stops and cover him in ice. And then he, I could see his fists ball up, and I'm like, you can't catch me. <laughs> and I'd pretend I was getting the shot that won the overtime goal for this Stanley Cup. And my brother's moods kept getting worse. And um, to the point that his therapist recommended, <clears throat> excuse me, that he, um, he take an ax and work in the woods and cut down trees and call them his hate trees and get all his hate out on the trees. Decent idea. 12 trees later, he was still going. And I was 11 and he was 12 and we were, and my brother had always said to me, he's just rude. And I wore like my favorite hockey player's jersey to school one day and everyone started calling me dyke, diesel, truck driver. That's not what real girls do. And I just wanted to play sports, you know? And um, so my brother was in this foul mood. He had sequestered himself in his room much of the summer eating salami and reading Hustler, <laughs> which frankly would make anybody cranky, honestly, if you, that's all you did. And, um, and we went to get new skates because it was time. And Harris was just, he just had that set in his eyes. And I thought, this is not gonna go well. And I was getting my skates, and he said, what are you getting the white skates for? Those are for real girls. I was like, Ugh. You know, and it just, it bugged me. And, um, and he got his black, shiny men's hockey skates that were amazing. And the guy was helping him lace them up. And, um, you know, his foot's in the thing. And he could tell Harris was in a really bad mood. And he said, come on, Mr. Sunshine, it's all gonna be okay. You don't cajole my brother out of a bad mood. And he looked at him and his eyes got that set look to them and I thought, my heart's pounding. And I thought, this is not gonna go well. And Harris's foot is like this. And he accidentally, on purpose, sliced the man's hand open. I never skated again until recently. And I, um, I just moved up to the, the islands and I see people skating all the time. And I think, this looks fun. I want to do this. How can I do that? Like, I want to skate out in the open and not hit a wall and turn around, and I want to be outside. I've never done that. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. You know, I'm 54 years old. I'm going to do this. And I went to the sporting goods store with my girlfriend, and the man said, how can I help you? And I said, I want the shiniest, blackest, fiercest pair of men's hockey skates you have. Thank you very much. Scott Laban. So I, I'm generally partial to stories about Vermont life, but tonight I thought it'd be fun to do something from an entirely different era and an entirely different place. Um, the era is 1972, and the place is Southeast Asia, uh, mostly Indonesia. The reason, well, 1972 was the summer between my junior and senior year in college. And back then, and maybe still today, I don't know, what you wanted to do that summer was travel and sow wild oats and that sort of thing because you knew you had just one year left before you embarked on a long, dull life of work and family responsibilities. I mean, this was your last chance to sow wild oats. Maybe you would get put off by law school or med school, only marginally better. Uh, or worse yet, you could get drafted. And I need to talk about the draft for just a minute, because some folks either don't remember or never knew how it worked. Um, originally, there were local draft boards that determined who went and who didn't. Um, it was theoretically universal, but not so much. There were all kinds of ways to get out of it. There was the student deferment, my favorite. There was um, conscientious objector status. You could go and convince the local board that your conscience wouldn't let you kill people, even, even communists. Uh, and, and then there were the medical exemptions. You need to find a doctor that could say you had a heart murmur or flat feet or bone spurs, which our <laughs> current president was afflicted with. Um, or most damning of all, you could exhibit homosexual tendencies. 
That was a that was an immediate uh, shows you how things have changed, right? Today, the LBGTQ community is fighting hard for equal access to the military. And in, in my day, straight guys were making passes at medical examiners to try to get the <laughs> opposite result. Um, the consequence of all these. Uh, exemptions was that the military was more and more made up of uh, either kids from poor families or uh, children of color or a few ultra patriotic good old boys from the south um, and it was nuts the the social justice types decided this wasn't fair um, that middle-class white Yankee boys were not given an opportunity to to fight for their country now I gotta say as an abstract principle, I am all for social justice. Um, however, when they changed it to a lottery, I'd be lying if I didn't say that some of the white middle class Yankee boys were feeling a certain amount of consternation about this. And the way the lottery worked was they put your, ne your number on a ping pong ball, your birth date, and put it in this big bin, you know, like. It would go around and one would get sucked up and, and they would read the, the birthday. They did this on TV, mind you, right? I mean, this was like megabucks in reverse. You didn't want your number to get called. And there were, there were draft lottery parties in dorms where you drank a lot of beer. And you know, some of the older people are nodding their heads, right? Uh, and and they, would, they would tell you the range that they thought they were gonna need for the next year. And in my year, it was 125 to 130. I was 135. Struck me as being a little close. So I was determined to leave no oat unsown this summer. Most folks went to Europe during this, during this year. Uh, there was even a book called Europe on $15 a day that was in everybody's backpack, you know. <laughs> I chose to go to Asia instead, partly because I studied Chinese in college, and I thought it might be a place to use it because you couldn't go to China back then. And I figured if you could do Europe on $15 a day, you ought to be able to do Asia on 10, right? So that's what I decided to do. And I, I got a grant uh, from the MacArthur Foundation. You may know that name from the Genius Awards for a million dollars, right? Uh, I, I'm not a genius and I didn't get a million dollars. In fact, I think they gave me $500 to research um, political socialization in Hong Kong schools, a topic that nobody cared a whit about, including me. But you know the old saying, you don't, you don't look a grant horse in the mouth. So I, <laughs> I took the money, and I didn't plan to spend a whole lot of time in a library anyhow. Now, back then, there were no like discount flights. If you wanted a cheap flight somewhere, you had to get a charter. And to do that, you need to join an organization. And I joined the Chinese American Recreation Club. I think it cost me 20 bucks or something. So I show up at the airport, and the first thing I notice is that the members of the Chinese American Recreation Club are, in fact, Chinese Americans. <laughs> um, I was the only white guy there. And that got me a lot of curious and a little suspicious looks. Uh, in fact, I heard the phrase several times, Yang Guaidza, which in Chinese means foreign devil, um, which I'm sure they meant in the most affectionate possible way. So we get on the plane, and I was not a world traveler. The most exotic place I'd been up to that point was New Jersey, and I was able to drive there from Maine. And we got in this thing called a stretch DC-8 which I had assumed was like a stretch limousine, right? They made the, the plane longer. No, what that meant was they crammed in more seats to stretch the number. And there, were, there was no in-flight entertainment, there was no food cart, there was no drink cart. It's possible if you were exhibiting obvious signs of dehydration, they would give you water, but that was just about it. And worst of all, it was before they banned smoking on planes. And I swear, every male member of the esteemed Chinese American Recreation Club was a smoker. You could not see from the back of the plane to the front. And I know that because I was in the absolute last row, the one jammed up against the bathrooms, you know, where the seats don't tilt. It was a 24-hour trip. 
from Zurich to Dubai to Sri Lanka to Taipei, eventually I land in Hong Kong to do my research. <clears throat> well, I was there about two days and I got cast in a movie as an extra, as an Italian policeman in a Bruce Lee movie <laughs> called Return of the Dragon. Chuck Norris is in it. Anybody know the movie? You do? Well, I was the guy the size of an ant in the final scene that made the arrest. Um, so that was fun. And then I did things like uh, I visited the, the c c casinos in Macau, and I went to the raffles and had high tea at the hotel in Singapore. I took the night train to Bangkok, Thailand, and slept on one of those upper bunks. I had all kinds of adventures. Uh, in Bangkok, which was a wild and woolly town, uh, I was nearly kidnapped by a band of felonious transvestites. Uh, I fought that off. Uh, I went up to Chiang Mai and I accidentally booked rooms in what turned out to be a house of ill repute, uh, called the White House, by the way. I, I'm not, this was not for political irony, it just was a White House. Um, but I ended up in Jakarta, which is really the heart of the story. When I traveled back then, uh, I'd stayed in very cheap places because I had no money, uh, like guest houses and hostels and so forth. But like once a week, I felt like Western food. So what I would do is I would put on my one good uh, set of clothes. The shirt that I had, I bought in Hong Kong, and it was a light lavender, shiny rayon Nehru shirt. <laughs> Some of you may not know Nehru shirts, but they were named after the Prime Minister of India, and they wore these jackets with a high collar and kind of embroidery around it and so forth. And I don't know exactly why they were popular. I think maybe the Beatles wore them on an album cover during the Maharishni Yogi. In any event, that's what I had. So I go to the Intercontinental Hotel in, in Jakarta, and I always would go for the breakfast buffet because I figured you got the most food for the money. And if by chance they mistook you for a guest, you didn't pay anything, you know? So I'm there, I'm eating my breakfast, and I see these other Westerners off to the side, and people are making a big fuss over them. And I say, who are they? And they say, well, those are the Bee Gees. They're in town for a concert on their tour. And I was more of a Rolling Stones fan myself, not a Bee Gees, and that was kind of cool. But I finished my breakfast, I walk out the door, and I met with this crowd of cheering people. They're cheering, they're clapping, they're jumping up and down, they're flashing photos. Clearly they think I'm a Bee Gee. <laughs> Seems ridiculous now, but you gotta imagine me 45 years younger, 45 pounds lighter, a full head of hair over the ears, a light dark beard, and that ridiculous shirt. Right? <laughs> I could have just stepped off the cover of Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. So they're che I don't know if you ever had the experience of having a crowd of people cheer at you, but it's quite a rush, it's, right? I mean, it, all I can compare it to is telling an extempo story. So I don't want to disappoint, right? I wave, I smile, I flash fives as I go down the whole thing, and, and people are handing out have albums with Sharpies that they want me to autograph, so I accommodate, I, I autograph them. And I now like to think that somewhere there's a little old Indonesian lady whose most prized possession is a framed Bee Gees album hanging on her wall, autographed by me. Lori Cohen. story of uh, the kid that goes begrudgingly to summer camp, gets a postcard from his parents a few weeks later that says, we're moving. <laughs> I got that postcard. I wasn't at summer camp. I was taking some time off from school, and I was living on a commune in southern Virginia. I'd been there a few months, a couple of months, and I decided it was probably time for me to figure out what I'm going to do. And um, they happened to have a rustic cabin at the edge of their property in the woods. 
and I decided to go spend the night by myself and think about life. And so off I went, and I found the cabin pretty easily. Um, nobody was expecting me back until the next afternoon. I got myself settled, and I grabbed a bucket and headed for the river for some water. I mentioned it was a rustic camp, right? <laughs> And um, just before I headed down the hill towards the river, I got my bearings, I looked around, and that's the last time I ever saw that cabin. I couldn't find it. Every time I headed back for the cabin, I found the damn river again. I later learned that it was a peninsula of land, but um, I looked for a few hours and it got dark out. And when you're in the woods and it's dark, it's kind of good to just settle down. There's not very far you can go. So I found a tree to make a friend with and kneel, uh, sat down with my back against the tree just in time for the skies to open up. And it was one of those really heavy summer pounding rains all night. The good thing was I couldn't hear any critters in the woods. So I couldn't get scared, you know, it was fine. And um, the rain stopped a little bit before sunrise. The sun came out, I kind of tried to wring my clothes out as best I could and went off to look for the cabin. For not long, I gave up and just followed the river out to the road, and um, which happened to be the road that the farm was on that I was staying at. And, got back to the farm, dried myself off. Nobody knew I'd been wandering through the woods all night. Um, later that day, I noticed that I had a small cut on my foot and um, these little red hard bumps. Never seen anything quite like it, and one of the folks at the farm noticed it, and we dug out the medical journals and started looking through the books trying to figure out what this was. I think most of the day were concerned that I picked up something infectious. <laughs> Everybody was going to break out in these little hard red bumps. And uh, well, the next morning, my foot was aching, and there were more of those little red bumps. And so they made me go to the local rural doctor. I never went to doctors very much when I was young, and I certainly had never gone without my parents. So I was still pretty young. Well. I, well, I was goofing off there, you know, I was barely, just turned 18. And um, so we go to the local rural doctor and he looks at me and goes, um, them's jigabytes. <laughs> All righty, what's that? Jigabyte. <laughs> and he, some little critter or something, you pick up in sand or in the woods, and you don't worry about a thing, just put some calamine on it if they, they're itchy, but you're just gonna be fine. Well, I didn't have a whole lot of confidence in this diagnosis of gigabytes. <laughs> but, all right, so be it. So at least they weren't contagious. So I could go back to the farm, and um, the mail had come, and there was a postcard for me from my mother. I could see it clear as day right now. It said, moving to Pittsburgh, someplace north of Rutland let you know when we get there. <laughs> this was before cell phones. This was in the 70s, some, <laughs> this is the third 70s story. And um, we had a four party line at the farm and did not use it for long distance calls. So it wasn't like I could just call my folks and say, so like someplace north of Rutland, that's a really big area. <laughs> It didn't say when they were moving. And I've got this foot that feels funny and it has these jig bites all over them. And I didn't feel really comfortable about this. Well, by the next morning, the foot had started to swell and the jig bites were still popping out. Well, I knew I wasn't getting bit by anything at the farm. So something was way off with that diagnosis. And I had the sense that it probably was time for me to go home. Well, I still knew where it was, so I caught a bus to New, um, New York City, where I would have to change for the bus to Vermont, and I arrived at Port Authority about 10 o'clock at night. So this is the story I was going to tell, how I got to the city late at night, and I found my brother's apartment, which was in the cloisters someplace north of Harlem. Never heard of it. Um, and the trials and tribulations of spending 
about 15 hours with my big brother in New York City, where he dragged me hither and yon. But then I got another email from Lovejoy. <laughs> and he said, Tell, give me a short bio, but don't describe yourself as storyteller. I can't have everybody describing themselves as storytellers. Well, that gave me pause. I'm not a storyteller. I've never claimed to be a storyteller. But what am I? I think I'm the keeper of stories. Um, my first story, the only other one I ever told, was about my big brother um, and his adventures. And I'm the keeper of our family stories, and there are so many. And, you know, there's this big deal right now to check your DNA, find out where you come from, look for your heritage. Well, your heritage isn't where you ancestors started from. It's the stories that have trickled down through your families. It's the story of my great-grandmother who, to supplement the family income, ran card games on the kitchen table behind the tailor shop at night, and they, where they lived next to um, Molly McGee's bar. It's the story of um, my grandfather's parking lot in Coney Island across from the entrance to Steeplechase. And he ended up hiring a mobster, low-level mobster who had just gotten out of jail. He needed a job for his cover. And my papa needed some cover to keep the um, people off the lot from trying to get stuff out of him. Well, that mobster, Tony, became a really close family friend. And uh, when my father proposed to my mother, Dad was still in um, school, had no money for a ring, which I guess you have to have a ring if you're going to get married, or if you were going to get married in the 40s. And Tony happened to have a friend named Lou Capone, who was going up the river for 10 years, from whence Tony just arrived. And so for really cheap, Papa was able to buy Al Capone's, or Lou Capone's ring with a enormous diamond, which he put into a ring set from my mother, and it was in a gold band without the initials LC on it. My dad's name was Leonard Cohen, so that worked out just fine. They both got a ring for the price of one. Or, or my mama with her pocketbook, and because they owned the parking lot where you could park for 75 cents a day, that pocketbook was black and must have weighed 40 pounds because it was all full of quarters. And the time she tapped the, sh the shoulder of a brinksman outside of a bank to ask him what time, and he turned around with a gun. And she hit him with that 40 pound black <laughs> purse. These are the stories that I keep and I hold close and that I share with my grandchildren. If they want to know, if they come over for an overnight they don't ask me to read them a story. They ask me to tell them a story. And I gladly do, because these are their stories. This is their heritage. This is their DNA. It was a time I had my, that my son tore everything out from under the sink looking for elbow grease to clean his bike with. <laughs> these, these are the stories that have value and meaning in our lives. And I'm proud to be a story keeper. And I bet there are many story keepers here because all our families have amazing histories and we're so blessed to hold those stories and to share them and keep them alive. So are you a story keeper too? Ray Van Voorhees. familiar with David Byrne? Yes. Maybe he is, yeah? David Byrne is a, is a songwriter from uh, Talking Heads. And one of his songs called Once in a Lifetime has a set of, uh, well, the lyrics go like this. The beginning of the lyrics are, um, of course, I'm going to forget it now, right? You may find yourself, um, I'm sorry. You may, you may find yourself in, 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 shotgun shack. You may find yourself living somewhere else in the world. You may find yourself 
behind a, 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 an automo a wheel in a large automobile, you may find yourself, I'm sorry, I'm pretty nervous. You might find yourself in a, in a big house with a, with a, with a, 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 with a, 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 woman, a woman that you love. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't know this, but I'm, I'm losing a little bit, sorry. Or you may ask yourself, well, why am I here? You know, and, and no, that's not those. What is it? Say, How, did How did I get here? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that, I apologize. Well, anyway, you know, about three months ago, or three years ago, I mean, I, I had a patient once ask me, how did you become a chiropractor? Not why did you become a chiropractor, but how you became a chiropractor. And, I, and I've never really been asked that question. I've been asked why many times. It's kind of easy to answer, but I never really evaluated, evaluated my life and, and, and determined how I became a chiropractor before. And you know, at that point, I always thought free will was the biggest part of my life. I would have to, uh, you know, I decided which direction I, I wanted to go. I determined, you know, whether I became a chiropractor, how I did in school, all those, those things. And then, in this, in this one moment when I was thinking about my life, I began to realize that there's these many, these many moments, these many moments that actually had a force, a driving force, a direction that may have and probably did alter the path that I was on at that point in time. In fact, there are many of those moments, much like vectors, you know, where they lined up from, from, end, from one end to the other. And I began to realize that there was actually a straight line between the time when I was 16 years old to the time now that I'm, that I'm a chiropractor. I never really looked at serendipity as being a part of my life at that point in time, but apparently it, it is. And so, the story really starts when I was 16 years old, this hormonally driven 16 year old that finally found a girlfriend at 16 that would actually talk to me. And I was one of those guys that, you know, I really didn't know how to talk to girls, would never ask them out, to, ask them to dance. So therefore I never danced. But here I am and I find a woman who, a young gal that actually liked me. I met her at my brother's wedding. And we were both in the wedding and you know, things took off. That was in my junior year, and we had a four-year relationship at that point in time. Well, in my senior year, the beginning of my senior year, I skipped school, the first week of school, it's in, it's in September, with my buddy Mike, and we're driving to see my girlfriend, Kathy, who lives actually in Rhode Island on Jones Beach State Park. So we had a long-distance relationship. I lived in, in Wattenjurst Falls. That's about a two-and-a-half-hour drive. So we skip school, and we're going to meet Kathy, who's also skipped with the friends of hers, with the friend who's to go to Jones Beach for the day. And we did. Had a wonderful day. It was a glorious day. And as all glorious moments are, they, they have to end at some point in time. So around 2 o'clock, we have to go home. Now, I have to go home because we have to be home for dinner and, and with, my, with my parents, obviously. And I have to keep that this, this illusion that somehow I, I went to school, which obviously I didn't. So we're going to leave somewhere around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And, and um, anybody, most people here from Long Island or New York, they know the traffic on the Long Island Expressway and around New York City can be an absolute nightmare. So we take off somewhere around 2.30, 3 o'clock, and we're doing okay, because most of the traffic at that point is leaving New York City, coming out to Long Island. So on the way to New York, it wasn't that bad. We got to the other side of New York, we get about a half hour outside of New York City in a town called Valhalla, New York, and it's, the, the traffic is a nightmare. There's so much traffic. Everybody's flying at high rates. It's really not stop and go. It's just really a lot, real fast and, and really crowded streets or crowded roads. Anyway, my buddy looks at me, Mike, and he says, this is really dangerous. We need to wear seatbelts. I look at him and says, seatbelts? I mean, this is 1969. Who the hell wears seatbelts? And I just, I didn't even know if they were in the car. So, you know, we pull over, and of course, they're stuck way in the back, you know, on the floorboard in the back. We finally pull them out, put our seatbelts on, take off at 65, 75 miles an hour, get about five minutes into the road, and bam, someone pulls out right in front of us, and we T-bone this car. Really bad accident. I was uh, unconscious for a little bit. All I seem to remember is a, a darkness with the shards of glass and reflections of light. And we come, I come through, and I, I wake up, and Mike's still in the seat with the seatbelt on. We take our seatbelts off. We go over to this car, this young woman is, what we thought was badly hurt, but she, she had a lot of little cuts on her face, lots of blood, the face tends to bleed quite a bit. 
So anyway, point is, we were all okay. She was hurt a little bit worse than we were, but we weren't bad. But we were brought to the hospital by the ambulance. And then, you know, here's the moment that's probably the worst moment of any parent's life. My father gets his call in the middle of the dinner, by the way, that I'm supposed to be at, you know, to keep up this illusion. And he gets a phone call that says, your son was in a car accident an hour north of you in Valhalla, and he's being taken to the hospital, Valhalla Hospital at that point. So he comes and picks us up, and I'm not really that bad. We, we were released that night, and the, the young lady was released the next day. But, you know, I, we have a few scratches. But my biggest nightmare is not what's wrong with me, but the fact that I'm going to have to drive home for the next hour with my father at this moment. It's, you know, it's, it's going to be the longest hour of my entire life at that point. But it turns out that that wasn't the case. Like most of our parents, I'm sure, he was very understanding, very loving, and he just cared that I wasn't really hurt badly. So, still in high school, senior year, time goes by, and during that time period, I developed the worst neck pain you could possibly have. I mean, it's that kind of pain where it just lives here on the top of your shoulder, pain down to my fingertips, it was all the time, it never stopped. It lasted for the better part of 10 years. So you learn to live with something like that, right? So I go through all the high school, play basketball, still have the pain. Um, graduate, most of my life at that point is about working, traveling, and going to college. All through that time period, lots of pain, pain the entire time. I went to the University of Dayton, graduated with a, a degree in physical education and a degree in biology. And left school, went back home, and you know, my, my goal at that point was to become a doctor. I wanted to become an orthopedic or, or a physical therapist, something that, that, that got me, you know, taking care of patients. In the meantime, I got a job in Kingston, New York, as a, as a manager at a fitness center. And it, it's, it's a great job, because I'm dealing with people. It's the first time I'm able to deal with people constantly. And, and my job was to make sure that people were keeping to their, you know, their, their, uh, their workout program. So I'm there for about a year. And in, world, in walks this beautiful woman. I mean, she, she is just, you know, at that point, just I, I think it's incredible. And her name is Ruth, and she's a chiropractor in Woodstock, New York. Anyway, um, where's that flag? So anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, I, all I want to do is go out with this woman. You know, I just want to ask her on a date, but I'm still pretty darn shy at this point. Hard to believe it. 28 years old, I'm still shy, but I am, and I, I really don't know how to go about it. Two months go by, and she's walking out of the locker room, and I still haven't asked her out. She walks right up to me, looks me in the eye, and says, would you like to come to my office and learn about chiropractic? I'm doing a chiropractic talk. So I'm thinking, yes, of course. I'm going to get a date. I'm going on a date with this beautiful woman. Well, of course, that's, you know, and I'm thinking, yes, she's into me. Of course she's into me. Of course she's not, because what she wants is me to learn about chiropractic so I can refer patients to her, but, you know, from, from the gym that I'm working at. But at that time, the hormones are flying. All I'm thinking is, yes, she wants to go on a date with me. So Wednesday comes. I go to this meeting, and there's eight people there. I mean, I, 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 somehow I thought I was going to be the only person, but there's eight, <laughs> but there's eight people there. So I'm still, I'm still running on the illusion that, yes, she really wants to be with me, but it's really, that's not the case, but I'm still in that space. So, you know, the other eight people are there because they want to, uh, they want to learn about as much chiropractic as possible. But all I want to learn, all I, I don't, to be honest with you, I didn't give a crap about chiropractic at that point. All I want to do is go on a date with this woman. So little by little, each person leaves. And finally, I'm there alone with her. So I'm about ready to ask her out. She looks me right in the eye and she says, would you like to be adjusted? Well, I, I don't know much about chiropractic at that point, but I do know that if she's, if she's gonna adjust me, she's probably gonna have to put her hands on her hands on me. So I'm like, I'm down with this, this is really good. I'm still, I still have a chance, you know? So I sit down, she does an exam. I haven't told her yet about my neck pain, and I didn't at all, because it's just something I lived with all this time. She lays me down on a table. I'm lying down on my back. She's at the end of the table holding my head. I'm looking up at her, these beautiful brown eyes. I'm falling in love by the second. She says, you're ready? I said, yes, and bam! She, when she adjusts my neck, and it was the last thing that's ever happened to me, and I'm thinking, oh my God, uh, it's an exorcist moment. You know? <laughs> uh, 
I'm, I'm expecting, like Linda Blair in The Exorcist, there's gonna be this green vomit flying at me. I, 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 I get up, and I look at her and say, what the hell did you just do to me? And I saw this fear in her eyes, like, oh my God, I must have hurt him. But the exact opposite was true. In fact, in that moment, the pain went away instantly. It was as if someone took a switch, pulled the switch off, and it, 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 it actually went away in that moment. First time in 10 years. So, in the time that it takes, a butterfly's winged flap. This woman went from the person that I really wanted to go to bed with to a mentor like that. And in that moment, I realized I needed to be a chiropractor. And I met with that, with that lady many times after that to determine where I went to school and how I would go about becoming a chiropractor. And she guided me to the school in Georgia. Not the school she went to, which is the school I wanted to go to. Ah, but, uh, <laughs> but Georgia. So I go down to Georgia and I, 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 I start school. I, I get a house to live in and I meet another student who's from Vermont. And he's down there going to chiropractic school as well. And so uh, we became best buddies, schoolmates. We came here, practiced together. His name is Fran Smith. We both practice in Vermont to this day. And uh, that's it. Jill Missile. So the best summer of my life coincided with the best job of my life in 2012 in my home state of Alaska. Now, I'm a consultant for a living, which means my jobs aren't really normal jobs. They could last anything from a couple hours to a couple days to a year or more, and they can encompass all sorts of tasks. Even though my specialty is emergency management and disaster planning, being a consultant is basically telling the world that you'll do anything for money. <laughs> so I get a lot of, when someone calls me to offer me a job or a contract, it's, you know, I never really know what I'm going to get. So I get a call from a colleague named Steve who's from an engineering firm. He calls me up, he says, hey Jill, I, I've got this work this summer, I don't know if you're really going to want to do it. And I said, alright, of course, inwardly, I'm going, of course I want to do it, you're going to pay me for something, I'll do it. <laughs> I said, but I played it a little cool, you know. I said, well, well, what is it? He said, well, you know, it's really hard physical labor. Okay, you know, I, I like working out. You know, that might be fun. He said it's in really remote locations in Alaska. And I'm like, well, I'd really like to travel in Alaska. So that sounds all right. He says, well, the only way to get to these sites is through like things like four wheelers. Now I'm really interested, right? But I can't be too excited because I want to get paid a lot. So I say, oh, okay, boy, that does sound difficult. <laughs> and he says, there are some sites we can't get to by four-wheeler. So you have to take a helicopter. So as the daughter of a helicopter pilot, I have a lot of respect for the machine. And I really know the dangers involved, got a lot of lectures about it. Um, so it's really easy to kind of say, you know, helicopters are fun, you know, woo. But the fact of the matter is that helicopters are really, really fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, you know, I, I'm okay with those travel modes. Uh, what's the work? He said, well, there's going to be a land swap between the federal government and the state government, but the state government won't take the land unless the federal government gets rid of all these illegal cabins that were built on it. So you have to go remove these cabins. And I said, all right, that sounds kind of interesting, but it, it, I'm just confused because it sounds like a demolition job. You know, why are you calling me? And he said, oh, because we really want someone on this job that won't burn down the state. <laughs> and I said, burn down the state? He said, yeah, we have to burn these cabins. And I said, Steve, are, <laughs> are you calling me to ask me if I will fly around in a helicopter all summer and burn down buildings? <laughs> <laughs> how much do I have to pay you to do this? <laughs> so with that, the best summer of my life started. So we were a ragtag group. There was me, the firebug. There was uh, Andre and Chad, the two giants. They are clearly for the muscle, even though they were engineers. Crazy. 
And we had kind of a string of, of environmental scientists, and they were all like kind of young, slight women uh, there for some reason. I still don't know what it was, but as Andre was fond of saying, you know, hey, they pull their weight, all 90 pounds of it. <laughs> so we took, we flew out to all sorts of locations. We took the four wheelers out. We had a blast. So before you start feeling too sorry for like the people who built these illegal cabins, these are just people that went out onto the land in Alaska. There's a lot of land and said, hey, it's really nice out here. Let's build the cabin. But they didn't own the land. So, you know, this, this, these cabins kind of dotted the landscape and it was everything from from like a falling down old trapper cabin full of porcupine shit which by the way is extremely flammable as i discovered um to like fully formed houses like two stories really really nice and the year before they had gone and posted all of these cabins even the porcupine shit one you know with a notice hey this is what's going on if you want to keep your cabin call us up and you know make your case for keeping it so really it's not our fault that no one did and I, I still can't believe that no one did. But um, we were supposed to remove all the non-burnables from all these cabins and then burn them down. And we had to hoist all the non-burnables out or drag them out with the four-wheelers. Um, so I really took it pretty seriously, even though this job was awesome. Um, because trees in Alaska are extremely flammable and burning down the state was actually a real possibility. So I had to monitor these fire conditions very carefully. Uh, we never had conditions where we could just light something on fire because of winds or proximity to other vegetation. And while they promised me that I would have adequate firefighting gear, uh, I discovered on our first job when I went to set up the portable pump, which, you know, you set it up by a lake and it sucks up water and you can spray it, had a nice, good, you know, two-inch hose, which is a good size hose, and no nozzle. So all that would come out is like a little dribble, and I couldn't really you know, spray. So our, so our pump isn't going to work. Uh, they gave me a shovel so I could dig a fire break. Well, the shovel's about this big, like that long. So that's not really going to work. So we were um, resigned to kind of taking apart these cabins piece by piece and um, taking out the non-burnables. And then I would burn the rest, build like a big bonfire, and we just kind of keep it under control. So that's how we did it. So at some point, Chad, who was really the foreman of this operation, even though I was a safety person, um, in the fire world, the safety person always gets the last say, but in the rest of the world, nobody cares what the safety person has to say. <laughs> so Chad became impatient with this idea that we had to take these cabins apart. And he's like, why can't we just burn them? And I'm like, well, Chad, you know, this whole state can go up in flames. But I could tell he was getting impatient. So one day he decided to drop me and the environmental scientists off to burn some Quonset hut somewhere while he and Dre went off to burn some other cabin. So by the time that we were all reunited as a team, I could tell that they hadn't listened to me because the big, like, white faces and big round eyes, when I got on the helicopter to meet them, they were like, yeah, we almost lost that one. And that was the last time they questioned my burning decisions. <laughs> so, we, at the, towards the end of the summer, it was all helicopter stuff, which was great. We'd already had our four-wheeler time. So we had our helicopter pilot join us. His name was Nate. Nate would spend most days sleeping in the backseat of the Long Ranger while we worked hard until Nate became enamored of our environmental scientist and realized he didn't look too cool like sleeping in the helicopter all day while his would-be love was there like shoveling porcupine crap, you know. So he starts trying to find these other ways of making himself useful. So I go up to the helicopter one day, which was parked like, parked? You park it? I guess you, I guess you do. You park it. Um, about a half mile away just because that's the only place that we could land and get something out of the helicopter and come trudging back and get to our cabin, which was one of those really rickety ones, like really dangerous, where people are stepping on nails and getting stuff dropped on their head and you know, all that safety stuff. <laughs> Nate's up on the roof of this ramshackle falling down cabin, shoveling asbestos off, you know, and I say, Nate, you remember we don't have comms here, right? That means like radio signal. He goes, yeah, so what? I said, well, in order to get a radio signal, we have to fly the helicopter up over the ridge. He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, as the only person capable of flying the helicopter, do you think maybe you should stay on the ground until then? <laughs> so he stayed with more safe pursuits until then. But we did see amazing sights. That day that we were dropped off at the Quonset Hut, which was just this old broken down wreck, um, we flew in and I noticed there was a whole lot of moose around, like big moose in rut which was very scary. And as we unloaded the helicopter, I realized we'd forgotten the shotgun. 
So I said to Nate, I'm like, hey, Nate, when you take off, can you just fly around and shoo those moose away? He's like, yeah, I can. <laughs> so he flies around, the moose all scatter, but there's one moose that doesn't scatter. It stands there. And Nate flies a helicopter over to it. Go away, moose. The moose is like, mm -mm. <laughs> Nate kind of charges the moose a little bit with the helicopter. The moose snorts at him and this jets of steam come out of its nose. <laughs> it was amazing. I, was, it was, I did not know what was going to happen, but eventually the moose just kind of turned around and walked off. Like, uh, all right. But that night at dinner, Chad looked at the schedule and he said, all right, tomorrow's the day. We said, the day? It's the day for what? It's the day we burned down Sarah Palin's cabin. <laughs> and I realized I had lived my entire life for this job. <laughs> Turns out the cabin she always talked about on the Denali Highway was an unpermitted illegal structure. <laughs> Let's go. So we are there at first light. And it was actually quite beautiful. It's on a lake. It has a really nice cabin, very well constructed. Uh, we started taking it apart. We took out all the non-burnables. And what we had to do is like heave them into a cargo net and Nate would you know, take them out and dump them, all that kind of stuff. And we took out a boat, which was quite a sight because a boat's shaped like a wing. So it's under the helicopter just flying. Yeah, it was kind of nuts. So we get this cabin down, and the fire's burning nice. We actually had good burning conditions. The fire's burning. Uh, the cabin's mostly gone. We're just kind of, you know, horsing out stuff. So I turned my attention to Sarah Palin's outhouse. And it was actually built very stoutly. There's high winds in the area, so there's cables chaining it to the ground. This thing did not want to come down. And I beat on it with a sledgehammer. I tried to take it apart with tools. I could not get this thing to come down. It was stuck. So I went and got the chop saw, and a chop saw is a very large hand tool, and it had a demolition blade on it, which is basically this nasty 16-inch blade with a bunch of chunks of metal on it. So I just walked around the, the outhouse, just cut a big hole around the outside, and pushed it over. Victory was mine. But then I looked down into the outhouse, and I realized that the backsplash is made of metal, which means we have to take it out because it's not burnable. And for some reason, none of my crew would reach in there and get it. <laughs> so I say, all right, well, what about, what if I burn it and like make everything really hot and then we'll pull it out and dunk it in the lake and cool it off. It'll be nice and sanitized. All right, cool. So I grab a bunch of stuff. I grab some old firewood and I throw it down the hole and I grab some propane and I throw it down the hole and I grab some jet fuel because that's what we were doing to burn stuff. Jet fuel is, is, is like burns really slow, strangely enough. Dump it in there. And then I go over to the fire and I pick up a log that's kind of smoldering, something with flame, and I kind of casually dump it in there. Well, when you mix propane and jet fuel <laughs> in a confined space, you make a bomb. <laughs> I have never seen a pink explosion before, but that outhouse went up in a jet of pink fire. And it was just really lucky that I wasn't leaning over at the time. <laughs> My eyebrows have grown back. <laughs> so it was a summer of adventure, and it was a summer of amazing sights. It was a tour of Alaska unlike anything that most people will ever see. And it will always be the best summer of my life. Thank you.